Victorian Tales of Cannabis, read by Kathleen Harrison McKenna and Terence McKenna, produced and directed and audially illuminated by sound photosynthesis. Forward, Terence McKenna. What we have here is four pieces of Victorian literature built around the theme of hashish intoxication. Uh, in every case but one, these are American writers, Richard Burton being the exception. Hashish was introduced into Europe by the French, but it didn't ever attain in Europe in the 19th century the kind of vogue that it was to attain in the United States, largely due to the literary efforts of Bayard Taylor and uh, Fitzhugh Ludlow. And in the readings we will hear, Fitzhugh Ludlow directly attributes his interest in hashish to the article by Bayard Taylor, which he had read a couple of years before his first hashish experiments when it was published in the Atlantic Monthly. There's a confluence of artistic and social intent in the American mind with the powers of hashish that seems extraordinarily serendipitous. In other words, the um, rich strain of American transcendentalism in fueled by the pre-Raphaelite strain in literature and architecture seemed ready-made for the kind of sublime and ecstatic visions which these American Victorians were able to obtain from eating their hashish. There is nothing comparable to these kinds of visionary excursions in the modern practice of smoking cannabis products because a much more diminished amount of the drug is delivered to the individual at any given time. If you notice, these descriptions of hashish intoxication are comparable to 20th century descriptions of intoxication with LSD or psilocybin, some of the stronger psychopharmacological agents. I don't think there can be much doubt that uh, Romanticism, American Transcendentalism, the French fascination with the Orient in uh, fashion and design and literature, all of these 19th century concerns, a, a, a general tendency toward the florid in design, in uh, philosophical thinking, uh, even in social forms, can in part be attributed to this strong orientalizing influence of which hashish was a major uh, player. The uh, Victorian literary style seems uniquely suited, especially in the case of Fitzhugh Ludlow, to conveying the confused, shifting, multi-leveled, and imagistic tonality that is typical of the hashish experience. So uh, it's a very fortuitous marriage of uh, style and subject matter that we meet in these four pieces, as I said, three by American uh, hashish aficionados, and uh, the exception being Richard Burton, whose pieces are drawn from his translation of The Thousand and One Nights and uh, show the influence of hashish on uh, climaxed Islamic society put through the filter of the fine job of translation that Burton did, a great Victorian traveler, polymath, and geographer in his own right. We had a dual motivation, my partner Kat and myself, in making these recordings. First of all, we thought that it was uh, a sufficient challenge to the partnership ideal to, for a man and a woman to try to re-embody the writing of these Victorian hashish aficionados. Two of the writings uh, accentuate the women's point of view, since Louisa May Alcott is one of the writers. And in the second case, Richard Burton's retelling of the Thousand and One Tales of Scheherazade 
is from a woman's uh, point of view, uses a woman's voice. The other motivation for this project uh, is the difficulty of obtaining printed versions of this material. Uh, there hasn't been an edition of Fitzhugh Ludlow since 1975. The previous edition was in the mid-1800s. There hasn't been an edition of Bayard Taylor since the first edition of 1853. So these materials are not available generally at your public library. And as uh, the debate on the social impact of cannabis accelerates, it's very important that we have access to these accounts by unbiased uh, early observers of the phenomenon. This first reading of Bayard Taylor's The Lands of the Saracen presents the earliest American account of hashish use. Uh, the Lands of the Saracen was published in 1855 and set the model for hashish reportage throughout uh, the rest of the 19th century and was a major influence on Fitzhugh Ludlow. I'm going to read chapter 10, The Visions of Hashish, which is the portion of the book in which most of the references to hashish taking are confined. This is Bayard Taylor, 1855. During my stay in Damascus, that insatiable curiosity which leads me to prefer the acquisition of all lawful knowledge through the channels of my own personal experience, rather than in less satisfactory and less laborious ways, induced me to make a trial of the celebrated hashish, that remarkable drug which supplies the luxurious Syrian with dreams more alluring and more gorgeous than the Chinese extracts from his darling opium pipe. The use of hashish, which is a preparation with the dried leaves of the cannabis indica, has been familiar to the East for many centuries. During the Crusades, it was frequently used by the Saracen warriors to stimulate them to the work of slaughter, and from the Arabic term of hashashin, or eaters of hashish, as applied to them, the word assassin has been naturally derived. An infusion of the same plant gives to the drink called bang, which is in common use throughout India and Malaysia, its peculiar properties. Thus prepared, it is a more fierce and fatal stimulant than the paste of sugar and spices to which the Turk resorts as the food of his voluptuous evening reveries. While its immediate effects seem to be more potent than those of opium, its habitual use, though attended with ultimate and permanent injury to the system, rarely results in such utter wreck of mind and body as that to which the votaries of the latter drug inevitably condemn themselves. A previous experience of the effects of hashish, which I took once and in a very mild form while in Egypt, was so peculiar in its character that my curiosity, instead of being satisfied, only prompted me the more to throw myself for once wholly under its influence. The sensations it then produced were those physically of exquisite lightness and airiness, mentally of a wonderfully keen perception of the ludicrous in the most simple and familiar objects. During the half hour in which it lasted, I was at no time so far under its control that I could not, with the clearest perception, study the changes through which I passed. I noticed with careful attention the fine sensations which spread throughout the whole tissue of my nervous fiber, each thrill helping to divest my frame of its earthly and material nature until my substance appeared to me no grosser than the vapors of the atmosphere. And while sitting in the calm of the Egyptian twilight, I expected to be lifted up and carried away by the first breeze that should ruffle the Nile. While this process was going on, the objects by which I was surrounded assumed a strange and whimsical expression. 
my pipe, the oars which my boatman plied, the turban worn by the captain, the water jars and culinary implements became in themselves so inexpressibly absurd and comical that I was provoked to a long fit of laughter. The hallucination died away as gradually as it came, leaving me overcome with a soft and pleasant drowsiness from which I sank into a deep, refreshing sleep. My companion and an English gentleman who with his wife was also residing in Antonio's pleasant caravanserai agreed to join me in the experiment. The dragoman of the latter was deputed to procure a sufficient quantity of the drug. He was a dark Egyptian speaking only the lingua franca of the East and asked me as he took the money and departed on his mission whether he should get hashish, peridere or per dormire. Oh, peridere, of course, I answered, and see that it be strong and fresh. It is customary with the Syrians to take a small portion immediately before the evening meal, and it is thus diffused through the stomach and acts more gradually as well as more gently upon the system. As our dinner hour was at sunset, I proposed taking hashish at the time, uh, but my friends, fearing that its operations might be more speedy upon fresh subjects and thus betray them into some absurdity in the presence of the other travelers, preferred waiting until after the meal. Uh, it was then agreed that we should retire to our room, which, as it rose like a tower one story higher than the rest of the building, was in a manner isolated and would screen us from observation. We commenced by taking a teaspoonful each of the mixture which Abdallah had procured. This was about the quantity I had taken in Egypt, and as the effect then had been so slight, I judged that we ran no risk of taking an overdose. The strength of the drug, however, must have been far greater in this instance, for whereas I could in the former case distinguish no flavor but that of sugar and rose leaves, I now found the taste intensely bitter and repulsive to the palate. We allowed the paste to dissolve slowly on our tongues and sat some time quietly waiting the result. But having been taken upon a full stomach, its operation was hindered, and after the lapse of nearly an hour, we could not detect the least change in our feelings. My friends loudly expressed their conviction of the humbug of hashish. But I, uh, unwilling to give up the experiment at this point, proposed that we should take an additional half spoonful and follow it with a cup of hot tea, which, if there were really any virtue in the preparation, could not fail to call it into action. This was done, though not without some misgivings, as we were all ignorant of the precise quantity which constituted a dose and the limits within which the drug could be taken with safety. It was now 10 o'clock. The streets of Damascus were gradually becoming silent, and the fair city was bathed in the yellow luster of the Syrian moon. Only in the marble courtyard below us, a few dragomen and mukaris lingered under the lemon trees beside the fountain in the center. I was seated alone, nearly in the middle of the room, talking with my friends, who were lounging upon a sofa placed in a sort of alcove at the farther end, when the same fine nervous thrill of which I have spoken suddenly shot through me. Uh, but this time it was accompanied by a burning sensation at the pit of the stomach. And instead of growing upon me with the gradual pace of healthy slumber and resolving me as before into air, it came with the intensity of a pang and shot throbbing along the nerves to the extremities of my body. The sense of limitation of the confinement of our senses within the bounds of our own flesh and blood instantly fell away. The walls of my frame were burst outward and tumbled into ruin, and without thinking what form I wore, losing sight even of an idea of form, I felt that I existed throughout a vast extent of space. The blood pulsed from my heart, sped through the uncounted leagues before it reached my extremities. 
The air drawn into my lungs expanded into seas of limpid ether, and the arch of my skull was broader than the vault of heaven. Within the concave that held my brain were the fathomless depths of blue. Clouds floated there, and the winds of heaven rolled them together, and there shone the orb of the sun. It was, though I thought not of that at the time, like a revelation of the mystery of omnipresence. It is difficult to describe this sensation or the rapidity with which it mastered me. In the state of mental exaltation in which I was then plunged, all sensations as they rose suggested more or less coherent images. They presented themselves to me in a double form, one physical and therefore to a certain extent tangible, the other spiritual and revealing itself in a succession of splendid metaphors. The physical feeling of extended being was accompanied by the image of an exploding meteor, not subsiding into darkness, but continuing to shoot from its center or nucleus, which corresponded to the burning spot at the pit of my stomach, incessant adumbrations of light that finally lost themselves in the infinity of space. To my mind, even now, this image is still the best illustration of my sensations, as I recall them, uh, but I greatly doubt whether the reader will find it equally clear. My curiosity was now in a way of being satisfied. The spirit, demon, shall I not rather say, of Hashish, had entire possession of me. I was cast upon the flood of his illusions and drifted helplessly whithersoever they might choose to bear me. The thrills which ran through my nervous system became more rapid and fierce, accompanied with sensations that steeped my whole being in unutterable rapture. I was encompassed by a sea of light through which played the pure, harmonious colors that are born of light. While endeavoring in broken expressions to describe my feelings to my friends, who sat looking upon me incredulously, not yet having been affected by the drug, I suddenly found myself at the foot of the great pyramid of Cheops. The tapering courses of yellow limestone gleamed like gold in the sun, and the pile rose so high that it seemed to lean for support upon the blue arch of the sky. I wished to ascend it, and the wish alone placed me immediately upon its apex, lifted thousands of feet above the wheat fields and palm groves of Egypt. I cast my eyes downward and, to my astonishment, saw that it was built not of limestone, but of huge square plugs of Cavendish tobacco. <laughs> Words cannot paint the overwhelming sense of the ludicrous which I then experienced. I writhed on my chair in an agony of laughter, which was only relieved by the vision melting away like a dissolving view, till, out of my confusion of indistinct images and fragments of images, another and more powerful vision arose. The more vividly I recall the scene which followed, the more carefully I restore its different features and separate the many threads of sensation which wove it into one glorious web, the more I despair of representing its exceeding glory. I was moving over the desert, not upon the rocking dromedary, but seated in a bark made of mother of pearl and studded with jewels of surpassing luster. The sand was of grains of gold, and my keel slid through them without sound or jar. The air was radiant with excess of light, though no sun was to be seen. I inhaled the most delicious perfumes, and harmonies such as Beethoven may have heard in dreams but never wrote floated around me. The atmosphere itself was light, odious music, and each and all sublimated beyond anything the sober senses are capable of receiving. Before me, for a thousand leagues, as it seemed, stretched a vista of rainbows whose colors gleamed with the splendor of gems, arches of living amethyst, sapphire, emerald, 
topaz and ruby, by thousands and tens of thousands, they flew past me as my dazzling barge sped down the magnificent arcade. Yet the vista still stretched as far as ever before me. I reveled in a sensuous Elysium which was perfect because no sense was left ungratified. But beyond all, my mind was filled with a boundless feeling of triumph. My journey was that of a conqueror, not of a conqueror who subdues his race either by love or by will, for I forgot that man existed, but one victorious over the grandest as well as the subtlest forces of nature, the spirits of light color, odor, sound, and motion were my slaves, and having these, I was master of the universe. Those who are endowed to any extent with the imaginative faculty must have at least once in their lives experienced feelings which may give them a clue to the exalted sensuous raptures of my triumphal march. The view of a sublime mountain landscape, the hearing of a grand orchestral symphony, or of a choral upborne by the full-voiced organ, or even the beauty and luxury of a cloudless summer day suggests emotions similar in kind, if less intense. They took a warmth and glow from that pure animal joy which degrades not, but spiritualizes and ennobles our material part, and which differs from cold, abstract intellectual enjoyment, as the flaming diamond of the Orient differs from the icicle of the North. Those finer senses which occupy a middle ground between our animal and, and intellectual appetites were suddenly developed to a pitch beyond what I had ever dreamed, and being thus at one and the same time gratified to the fullest extent of their preternatural capacity, the result was a single harmonious sensation to describe which human language has no epithet. Mahatma's paradise with its palaces of ruby and emerald, its airs of musk and cassia, and its rivers colder than snow and sweeter than honey, would have been a poor and mean terminus for my arcade of rainbows. Yet in the character of this paradise, in the gorgeous fancies of the Arabian nights, in the glow and luxury of all oriental poetry, I now recognize more or less the agency of hashish. The fullness of my rapture expanded the sense of time, and though the whole vision was probably no more than five minutes in passing through my mind, years seemed to have elapsed while I shot under the dazzling myriads of rainbow arches. By and by, the rainbows, the bark of pearl and jewels, and the desert of golden sand vanished, and, still bathed in light and perfume, I found myself in a land of green and flowery lawns, divided by hills of gently undulating outline. But, although the vegetation was the richest of earth, there were neither streams nor fountains to be seen, and the people who came from the hills with brilliant garments that shone in the sun besought me to give them the blessing of water. Their hands were full of branches of the coral honeysuckle in bloom. These I took, and breaking off the flowers one by one, set them in the earth. The slender trumpet-like tubes immediately became shafts of masonry and sank deep into the earth. The lip of the flower changed into a circular mouth of rose-colored marble, and the people, leaning over its brink, lowered their pitchers to the bottom with cords and drew them up again, filled to the brim and dripping with honey. The most remarkable feature of these illusions was that at that time when I was most completely under their influence, I knew myself to be seated in the tower of Antonio's hotel in Damascus, knew that I had taken hashish, and that the strange, gorgeous, and ludicrous fantasies which possessed me were the effect of it. At the very instant that I looked upon the valley of the Nile from the pyramid, slid over the desert, or created my marvelous wells in that beautiful pastoral country, 
I saw the furniture of my room, its mosaic pavement, the quaint Saracenic niches in the walls, the painted and gilded beams of the ceiling, and the couch in the recess before me with my two companions watching me. Both sensations were simultaneous and equally palpable. While I was most given up to the magnificent delusion, I saw its cause and felt its absurdity most clearly. Metaphysicians say that the mind is incapable of performing two operations at the same time, and may attempt to explain this phenomenon by supposing a rapid and incessant vibration of the perceptions between the two states. This explanation, however, is not satisfactory to me, for not more clearly does a skillful musician with the same breath blow two distinct musical notes from a bugle than I was conscious of two distinct conditions of being in the same moment. Yet, singular as it may seem, neither conflicted with the other. My enjoyment of the visions was complete and absolute, undisturbed by the faintest doubt of their reality, while in some other chamber of my brain, reason sat coolly watching them and heaping the liveliest ridicule on their fantastic features. One set of nerves was thrilled with the bliss of the gods, while another was convulsed with unquenchable laughter at that very bliss. My highest ecstasies could not bear down and silence the weight of my ridicule, which in its turn was powerless to prevent me from running into other and more gorgeous absurdities. I was double, not swan and shadow, but rather sphinx-like, human and beast, a true sphinx, I was a riddle and a mystery to myself. The drug, which had been retarded in its operation on account of been being taken after a meal, now began to make itself more powerfully felt. The visions were more grotesque than ever, but less agreeable, and there was a painful tension throughout my nervous system, the effect of overstimulus. I was a mass of transparent jelly, and a confectioner poured me into a twisted mold. I threw my chair aside and writhed and tortured myself for some time to force my loose substance into the mold. At last, when I had so far succeeded that only one foot remained outside, it was lifted off, and another mold of still more crooked and intricate shape substituted. I have no doubt that the contortions through which I went to accomplish the end of my gelatinous destiny would have been extremely ludicrous to a spectator, but to me they were painful and disagreeable. The sober half of me went into fits of laughter over them, and through that laughter my vision shifted into another scene. I had laughed until my eyes overflowed profusely. Every drop that fell immediately became a large loaf of bread and tumbled upon the shop floor of a baker in the bazaar at Damascus. The more I laughed, the faster the loaves fell, until such a pile was raised about the baker that I could hardly see the top of his head. Head. The man will be suffocated, I cried, but if he were to die, I cannot I stop. <laughs> My perceptions now became more dim and confused. I felt that I was in the grasp of some giant force, and in the glimmering of my fading reason grew earnestly alarmed, for the terrible stress under which my frame labored increased every moment. A fierce and furious heat radiated from my stomach throughout my system. My mouth and throat were as dry and as hard as if made of brass, and my tongue, it seemed to me, was a bar of rusty iron. I seized a pitcher of water and drank long and deeply, but I might as well have drunk so much air, for not only did it impart no moisture, but my palate and throat gave me no intelligence of having drunk at all. I stood in the center of the room, brandishing my arms convulsively and heaving sighs that seemed to shatter my whole being. Will no one, I cried in distress, cast out this devil that has possession of me? I no longer saw the room nor my friends, but I heard one of them saying, It must be real. He could not counterfeit such an expression as that, but it don't look much like pleasure. Immediately afterwards, there was a scream of the wildest laughter, and my countrymen sprang upon the floor, exclaiming, Oh, ye gods, I am a locomotive! 
this was his ruling hallucination, and for the space of two or three hours he continued to pace to and fro with a measured stride, exhaling his breath in violent jets, and when he spoke, dividing his words into syllables, each of which he brought out with a jerk, at the same time turning his hands at his sides as if they were the cranks of imaginary wheels. The Englishman, as soon as he felt the dose beginning to take effect, prudently retreated to his own room, and what the nature of his visions were we never learned, for he refused to tell, and moreover enjoined the strictest silence on his wife. Uh, by this time it was nearly midnight. I had passed through the paradise of Hashish and was plunged at once into its fiercest hell. In my ignorance I had taken what I have since learned would have been a sufficient portion for six men and was now paying a frightful penalty for my curiosity. The excited blood rushed through my frame with a sound like the roaring of mighty waters. It was projected into my eyes until I could no longer see. It beat thickly in my ears and so throbbed in my heart that I feared the ribs would give way under its blows. I tore open my vest, placed my hand over the spot, and tried to count the pulsations. But there were two hearts, one beating at the rate of a thousand beats a minute and the other with a slow, dull motion. My throat, I thought, was filled to the brim with blood and streams of blood were pouring from my eyes. I felt them gushing warm down my cheeks and neck. With a maddened, desperate feeling, I fled from the room and walked over the flat terraced roof of the house. My body seemed to shrink and grow rigid as I wrestled with the demon and my face to become wild, lean, and haggard. Some lines which had struck me years before in reading Mrs. Browning's Rhymes of the Duchess May flashed into my mind, and the horse in stark despair with his front hoofs poised in air on the last verge rears a mane, and he hangs, he rocks between, and his nostrils curdle in, and he shivers head and hoof, and the flakes of foam fall off, and his face grows fierce and thin. That picture of animal terror and agony was mine. I was the horse hanging poised on the verge of the giddy tower, the next moment to be borne sheer down to destruction. Involuntarily, I raised my hand to feel the leanness and sharpness of my face. Oh, horror! The flesh had fallen from my bones, and it was a skeleton head that I carried on my shoulders. With one bound, I sprang to the parapet and looked into the silent courtyard, then filled with the shadows thrown into it by the sinking moon. Shall I cast myself down headlong, was the question I proposed to myself. But through the horror of that skeleton delusion was greater than my fear of death. There was an invisible hand at my breast which pushed me away from the brink. I made my way back to the room in a state of the keenest suffering. My companion was still a locomotive, rushing to and fro and jerking out his syllables with a disjointed accent peculiar to a steam engine. His mouth had turned to brass like mine, and he raised the pitcher to his lips in the attempt to moisten it. But before he had taken a mouthful, set the pitcher down again with a yell of laughter, crying out, how can I take water into my boiler while I am letting off steam? But I was too far gone to feel the absurdity of this or his other exclamations. I was sinking deeper and deeper into a pit of unutterable agony and despair, for although I was not conscious of any real pain in any part of my body, the cruel tension to which my nerves had been subjected filled me through and through with a sensation of distress which was far more severe than pain itself. In addition to this, the remnant of will with which I struggled against the demon became gradually weaker, and I felt that I soon should be powerless in his hands. Every effort to preserve my reason was accompanied by a pang of mortal fear, lest what I now experienced was insanity and would hold mastery over me forever. The thought of death, which also haunted me, was far less bitter than this dread. I knew that in the struggle which was going on in my frame, I was born fearfully near the dark gulf, 
and the thought that at such a time both reason and will were leaving my brain filled me with an agony the depth and blackness of which I should vainly attempt to portray. I threw myself on my bed with the excited blood still roaring wildly in my ears, my heart throbbing with a force that seemed to be rapidly wearing away my life, my throat dry as a pot shard, and my stiffened tongue cleaving to the roof of my mouth, resisting no longer but awaiting my fate with the apathy of despair. My companion was now approaching the same condition, but as the effect of the drug on him had been less violent, so his stage of suffering was more clamorous. He cried out to me that he was dying, implored me to help him, and reproached me vehemently because I lay there silent, motionless, and apparently careless of his danger. Why will he disturb me, I thought? He thinks he is dying, but what is death to madness? Let him die. A thousand deaths were more easily borne than the pangs I suffer. While I was sufficiently conscious to hear his exclamations, they only provoked my keen anger. But after a time, my senses became clouded and I sank into a stupor. As near as I can judge, this must have been three o'clock in the morning, rather more than five hours after the hashish had begun to take effect. I lay thus all the following day and night in a state of gray, blank oblivion, broken only by a single wandering gleam of consciousness. I recollect hearing Francois's voice. He told me afterwards that I arose, attempted to dress myself, drank two cups of coffee, and then fell back into the same death-like stupor. But of all this, I did not retain the least knowledge. On the morning of the second day, after a sleep of thirty hours, I awoke again to the world with a system utterly prostrate and unstrung, and a brain clouded with the lingering images of my visions. I knew where I was and what had happened to me, but all I saw still remained unreal and shadowy. There was no taste in what I ate, no refreshment in what I drank, and it required a painful effort to comprehend what was said to me and return a coherent answer. Will and reason had come back, but they still sat unsteadily upon their thrones. My friend, who was much further advanced in his recovery, accompanied me to the adjoining bath, which I hoped would assist in restoring me. It was with great difficulty that I preserved the outward appearance of consciousness. In spite of myself, a veil now and then fell over my mind, and after wandering for years, as it seemed, in some distant world, I awoke with a shock to find myself in the steamy halls of the bath with a brown Syrian polishing my limbs. I suspect that my language must have been rambling and incoherent, and that the menials who had me in charge understood my condition. For as soon as I stretched myself upon the couch which follows the bath, a glass of very acid sorbet was presented me, and after drinking it, I experienced instant relief. Still, the spell was not wholly broken, and for two or three days I continued subject to frequent involuntary fits of absence which made me insensible for the time to all that was passing around me. I walked the streets of Damascus with a strange consciousness that I was in some other place at the same time and with a constant effort to reunite my divided perceptions. Previous to the experiment, we had decided on making a bargain with the sheikh for the journey to Palmyra. The state, however, in which we now found ourselves obliged us to relinquish the plan. Perhaps the excitement of a forced march across the desert and a conflict with the hostile Arabs, which was quite likely to happen, might have assisted us in throwing off the baneful effects of the drug. But all the charm which lay in the name of Palmyra and the romantic interest of the trip was gone. I was now without courage and without energy, and nothing remained for me but to leave Damascus. Yet, fearful as my rash experiment proved to me, I did not regret having made it. It revealed to me deeps of rapture and of suffering which my natural faculties never could have sounded. It has taught me the majesty of human reason and of human will, even in the weakest, and the awful peril of tampering with that which assails our integrity. 
I have here faithfully and fully written out my experience on account of the lesson which it may convey to others. If I have unfortunately failed in my design and have but awakened that restless curiosity which I have endeavored to forestall, let me beg all who are thereby led to repeat the experiment upon themselves that they be content to take the portion of hashish which is considered sufficient for one man and not like me swallow enough for six.
Perilous Play. If someone does not propose a new and interesting amusement, I shall die of ennui, said pretty Belle Daventry in a tone of despair. I have read all my books, used up all my Berlin wools, and it's too warm to go to town for more. No one can go sailing yet as the tide is out. We are all nearly tired to death of cards, croquet, and gossip. So what shall we do to while away this endless afternoon? Dr. Meredith, I command you to invent and propose a new game in five minutes. To hear is to obey, replied the young man who lay in the grass at her feet as he submissively slapped his forehead and fell a-thinking with all his might. Holding up her finger to preserve silence, Belle pulled out her watch and waited with an expectant smile. The rest of the young party, who were indolently scattered about under the elms, drew nearer and brightened visibly, for Dr. Meredith's inventive powers were well known, and something refreshingly novel might be expected from him. One gentleman did not stir, but then he lay within earshot and merely turned his fine eyes from the sea to the group before him. His glance rested a moment on Belle's piquant figure, for she looked very pretty with her bright hair blowing in the wind, one plump white arm extended to keep order, and one little foot in a distracting slipper just visible below the voluminous folds of her dress. Then the glance passed to another figure, sitting somewhat apart in a cloud of white muslin, for an airy burnous floated from head to shoulders, showing only a singularly charming face. Pale and yet brilliant, for the southern eyes were magnificent. The clear olive cheeks contrasted well with darkest hair, lips like a pomegranate flower, and delicate straight brows as mobile as the lips. A cluster of crimson flowers, half falling from the loose black braids, and a golden bracelet of Arabian coins on the slender wrist were the only ornaments she wore and became her better than the fashionable frippery of her companions. A book lay on her lap, but her eyes, full of a passionate melancholy, were fixed on the sea, which glittered around an island green and flowery as a summer paradise. Rose St. Just was as beautiful as her Spanish mother, but had inherited the pride and reserve of her English father, and this pride was the thorn which repelled lovers from the human flower. Mark Dunn sighed as he looked, and as if the sigh, low as it was, roused her from her reverie, Rose flashed a quick glance at him, took up her book, and went on reading the legend of the Lotus Eaters. Time is up now, doctor, cried Belle, pocketing her watch with a flourish. Ready to report, answered Meredith, sitting up and producing a little box of tortoise shell and gold. How mysterious! What is it? Let me see first. And Belle removed the cover, looking like an inquisitive child. Only bonbons. How stupid. That won't do, sir. We don't want to be fed with sugar plums. We demand to be amused. Eat six of these despised bonbons, and you will be amused in a new, delicious, and wonderful manner, said the young doctor, laying half a dozen on a green leaf and offering them to her. Why, what are they, she asked, looking at him askance. Mm. Hashish. Hashish. Did you, you never, never hear, hear of it? it? Oh, yes. It's that Indian stuff, which brings one fantastic visions, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to see and taste it, and now I will, cried Belle nibbling at one of the bean-shaped comfits with its green heart. I advise you not to try it. People do all sorts of queer things when they take it. I wouldn't for the world, said a prudent young lady, warningly, as all examined the box and its contents. Six can do no harm, I give you my word. I take twenty before I can enjoy myself, and some people even more. I've tried many experiments, both on the sick and the well, and nothing ever happened amiss, though the demonstrations were immensely interesting, said Meredith, eating his sugar plums with a tranquil air, which was very convincing to the others. How shall I feel, asked Belle, beginning on her second comfort. A heavenly dreaminess comes over one, in which they move as if on air, Everything is calm and lovely to them. No pain, no care, no fear of anything. And while it lasts, one feels like an angel, half asleep. 
But, but if, if one, one takes, takes too, much, too much, how then, said a deep voice behind the doctor. Hum, well, that's not so pleasant, unless one likes phantoms, frenzies, and a touch of nightmare, which seems to last a thousand years. Ever try it, Dunn, replied Meredith, turning toward the speaker, who was now leaning on his arm and looking interested. Never. No, 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 I'm not no, a good no, subject for experiments. Too nervous a temperament to play pranks with. I should say ten would be about your number. Less than that seldom affects men. Ladies go off sooner and don't need so many. Miss St. Just, may I offer you a taste of Elysium? I owe my success to you, said the doctor, approaching her deferentially. To me? And how? she asked, lifting her large eyes with a slight smile. I was in the depths of despair when my eye caught the title of your book, and I was saved, for I remembered that I had hashish in my pocket. Are you a lotus eater, she said, permitting him to lay the six charmed bonbons on the page. My faith, no. I use it for my patients. It is very efficacious in nervous disorders. It is getting to be quite a pet remedy with us. I do not want to forget the past, but to read the future. Will Hashish help me to do that, asked Rose, with an eager look, which made the young man flush, wondering if he bore any part of her hopes of that veiled future. Alas, no, I wish it could, for I too long to know my fate, he answered, very low, as he looked into the lovely face before him. The soft glance changed to one of cool indifference, and Rose gently brushed the hashish off her book, saying, with a little gesture of dismissal, then I have no desire to taste Elysium. The white morsels dropped into the grass at her feet, but Dr. Meredith let them lie and turning sharply, went back to sun himself in Belle's smiles. I've eaten all mine, and so has Evelyn. Mr. Norton will see goblins, I know, for he has taken quantities. I'm glad of it, for he does not believe in it, and I want to have him convinced by making a spectacle of himself for our amusement, said Belle, in great spirits at the new plan. When does the trance come on? asked Evelyn, a shy girl, already rather alarmed at what she had done. About three hours after you take your dose, though the time varies with different people. Your pulse will rise, heart beat quickly, eyes darken and dilate, and an uplifted sensation will pervade you generally. Then these symptoms change and the bliss begins. I've seen people sit or lie in one position for hours, wrapped in a delicious dream, and wake from it as tranquil as if they had not had a nerve in their bodies. How charming. I'll take some every time I'm worried. Let me see. It's now four, so our trances will come about seven, and we will devote the evening to manifestations, said Belle. Come, Dunn, try it. We are all going in for the fun. Here's your dose, and Meredith tossed him a dozen bonbons twisted up in a bit of paper. No, thank you. I know myself too well to risk it. If you are all going to turn hashish eaters, you'll need someone to take care of you, so I'll keep sober tossing the little parcel back. It fell short, and the doctor, too lazy to pick it up, let it lie, merely saying with a laugh, Well, I advise any bashful man to take hashish when he wants to offer his heart to any fair lady, for it will give him the courage of a hero, and the eloquence of a poet, and the ardor of an Italian. Remember that, gentlemen, and come to me when the crisis approaches. Does Does it it conquer the pride, rouse the pity, and soften the hard hearts of the fair sex? asked Dunn. I dare say now is your time to settle the fact, for here are two ladies who have imbibed, and in three hours will be in such a seraphic state of mind that no will be an impossibility to them. Oh, mercy on us! What have we done? If that's the case, I shall shut myself up till my foolish fit is over. Rose, you haven't taken any. I beg you to mount guard over me and see that I don't disgrace myself by any nonsense. Promise me that you will, cried Belle, in half-real, half-feigned alarm at the consequences of her prank. I promise, said Rose, and floated down the green path as noiselessly as a white cloud with a curious smile on her lips. Don't tell any of the rest what we have done, but after tea let us go into the grove and compare notes, said Norton, as Dunn strolled away to the beach, and the voices of approaching friends broke the summer quiet. 
At tea, the initiated glanced covertly at one another and saw, or fancied they saw, the effects of the hashish in a certain suppressed excitement of manner and unusually brilliant eyes. Belle laughed often, a silvery ringing laugh, pleasant to hear. But when complimented on her good spirits, she looked distressed and said she could not help her merriment. Meredith was quite calm, but rather dreamy. Evelyn was pale, and her next neighbor heard her heart beat. Norton talked incessantly, but as he talked in uncommonly well, no one suspected anything. Dunn and Miss St. Just watched the others with interest and were very quiet, especially Rose, who scarcely spoke but smiled her sweetest and looked very lovely. The moon rose early, and the experimenters slipped away to the grove, leaving the outsiders on the lawn as usual. Some bold spirit asked Rose to sing, and she at once complied, pouring out Spanish airs in a voice that melted the hearts of her audience, so full of fiery sweetness or tragic pathos was it. Dunn seemed quite carried away, and lay with his face in the grass to hide the tears that would come till, afraid of openly disgracing himself, he started up and hurried down to the little wharf, where he sat alone, listening to the music with a countenance which plainly revealed to the stars the passion which possessed him. The sound of loud laughter from the grove, followed by entire silence, caused him to wonder what demonstrations were taking place, and half resolved to go and see. But that enchanting voice held him captive, even when a boat put off mysteriously from a point nearby and sailed away like a phantom through the twilight. Half an hour afterward, a white figure came down the path, and Rose's voice broke in on his midsummer night's dream. The moon shone clearly now and showed him the anxiety in her face as she said hurriedly, Where is Belle? Gone sailing, I believe. How could you let her go? She was not fit to take care of herself. I forgot that. So did I, but I promised to watch over her, and I must. Which way did they go, demanded Rose, wrapping the white mantle about her and running her eye over the little boats moored below. Will you follow her? Yes. I'll be your guide, then. They went toward the lighthouse. It is too far to row. I am at your service. Oh, say yes, cried Dunn, leaping into his own skiff and offering his hand persuasively. She hesitated an instant and looked at him. He was always pale and the moonlight seemed to increase this pallor, but his hat brim hid his eyes, and his voice was very quiet. A loud peal of laughter floated over the water, and as if the sound decided her, she gave him her hand and entered the boat. Dunn smiled triumphantly as he shook out the sail, which caught the freshening wind, and sent the boat dancing along a path of light. How lovely it was! All the indescribable allurements of a perfect summer night surrounded him. Balmy airs, enchanting moonlight, distant music, and close at hand the delicious atmosphere of love, which made itself felt in the eloquent silences that fell between them. Rose seemed to yield to the subtle charm and leaned back on the cushioned seat with her beautiful head uncovered, her face full of dreamy softness and her hands lying loosely clasped before her. She seldom spoke, showed no further anxiety for Belle, and soon seemed to forget the object of her search, so absorbed was she in some delicious thought which wrapped her in its peace. Dunn sat opposite, flushed now, restless and excited, for his eyes glittered. The hand on the rudder shook, and his voice sounded intense and passionate, even in the utterance of the simplest words. He talked continually and with an unusual brilliancy, for, though a man of many accomplishments, he was too indolent or too fastidious to exert himself, except among his peers. Rose seemed to look without seeing, to listen without hearing, and though she smiled blissfully, the smiles were evidently not for him. On they sailed, scarcely heeding the bank of black cloud piled up in the horizon, the rising wind, or the silence which proved their solitude. Rose moved once or twice and lifted her hand as if to speak, but sank back mutely, and the hand fell again as if it had not energy enough to enforce her wish. A cloud sweeping over the moon, a distant growl of thunder, 
and the slight gust that struck the sail seemed to rouse her. Don was singing now, like one inspired, his hat at his feet, hair in disorder, and a strangely rapturous expression in his eyes, which were fixed on her. She started, shivered, and seemed to recover herself with an effort. Where are they, she asked, looking vainly for the island heights and the other boat. They have gone to the beach, I fancy, but we will follow. As Dunn leaned forward to speak, she saw his face and shrank back with a sudden flush, for in it she read clearly what she had felt, yet doubted until now. He saw the telltale blush and gesture and said impetuously, You know it now. You cannot deceive me longer or daunt me with your pride. Rose, I love you and dare tell you so tonight. Not now, not here. I will not listen. Turn back and be silent. I entreat you, Mr. Dunn, she said. He laughed a defiant laugh and took her hand in his, which was burning and throbbing with the rapid heat of his pulse. No, I will have my answer here and now and never turn back till you give it. You have been a thorny rose and given me many wounds. I'll be paid for my heartache with sweet words, tender looks, and frank confessions of love. For proud as you are, you do love me and dare not deny it. Something in his tone terrified her. She snatched her hand away and drew beyond his reach, trying to speak calmly and to meet coldly the ardent glances of the eyes, which were strangely darkened and dilated with uncontrollable emotion. You forget yourself. yourself. I shall give no answer to an avowal made in such terms. Take Take me home home instantly, instantly, she said in a tone of anger. Confess you love me, Rose. Never. Never. Ah, I'll have a kinder answer or... Dunn half rose and put out his hand to grasp and draw her to him. But the cry she uttered seemed to arrest Ah. him with a sort of shock. Control yourself. He dropped into his seat passed his hands over his eyes and shivered nervously as he muttered in an altered tone. I I meant nothing. It's the moonlight. Sit down. I'll control myself. Upon my soul, I will. If you do not, I shall go overboard. Are you mad, sir? cried Rose, trembling with indignation. I am just full. Then I shall follow you, for I am mad, Rose, with love. Hashish. His voice sank to a whisper but the last word thrilled along her nerves as no sound of fear had ever done before. An instant she regarded him with a look which took in every sign of unnatural excitement. Then she clasped her hands with an implorable gesture, saying in a tone of despair, Why did I come? How will it end? Oh, Mark, take me home before it is too late. Hush, be calm. Don't thwart me or I may get wild again. My thoughts are not clear, but I understand you. There, take my knife, and if I forget myself, kill me. Don't go overboard. You are too beautiful to die, my rose. He threw her the slender hunting knife he wore, looked at her a moment with a far-off look, and trimmed the sail like one moving in a dream. Rose took the weapon, wrapped her cloak closely about her, and crouching as far away as possible, kept her eye on him with a face in which watchful terror contended with some secret trouble and bewilderment more powerful than her fear. The boat moved round and began to beat up against wind and tide. Spray flew from her bow. The sail bent and strained in the gusts that struck it with perilous fitfulness. The moon was nearly hidden by scudding clouds, and one half the sky was black with the gathering storm. Rose looked from threatening heavens to treacherous sea and tried to be ready for any danger, but her calm had been sadly broken and she could not recover it. Dunn sat motionless, uttering no word of encouragement, though the frequent flaws almost tore the rope from his hand and the water often dashed over him. Are we in any Are we danger? in any danger? asked Rose at last, unable to bear the silence, for he looked like a ghostly helmsman seen by the fitful light, pale now, wide-eyed and speechless. Yes, great danger. I thought you were a skillful boatman. I am when I am myself. Now I am rapidly losing the control of my will, and the strange quiet is coming over me. If I had been alone, I should have given up sooner, but for your sake, I've kept on. Can't you work the boat, asked Rose, terror-struck by the changed tone of his voice, the slow, uncertain movements of his hands? No, 
I see everything through a thick cloud. Their voice sounds far away, and my one desire is to lay my head down and sleep. Let me steer. I can. I must, she cried, springing toward him, laying her hand on the rudder. He smiled and kissed the little hand, saying dreamily, You could not hold it a minute. Sit by me, love. Let us turn the boat again and drift away together, anywhere, anywhere out of the world. Oh, heaven, what will become of us? And Rose wrung her hands in real despair. Mr. Dunn, Mark, dear Mark, rouse yourself and listen to me. Turn, as you say, for it is certain death to go on. Turn and let us drift down to the lighthouse. They will hear and help us. Quick, take down the sail. Get out the oars and let us try to reach there before the storm breaks. As Rose spoke, he obeyed her like a dumb animal. Love for her was stronger even than the instinct of self-preservation. And for her sake, he fought against the treacherous lethargy, which was swiftly overpowering him. The sail was lowered. The boat brought round, and with little help from the ill-pulled oars, it drifted rapidly out to sea with the ebbing tide. As she caught her breath after this dangerous maneuver was accomplished, Rose asked in a quiet tone she vainly tried to render natural, Uh, How much hashish did you take? All that Meredith threw me, too much, but I was possessed to do it, so I hid the roll and tried it, he answered, peering at her with a weird laugh. (laughs) <laughs> let us talk. Our safety lies in keeping awake, and I dare not let you sleep, continued Rose, dashing water on her own hot forehead with a sort of desperation. Say you love me. That would wake me from my lost sleep, I think. I have hoped and feared, waited and suffered so long. Be pitiful and answer, Rose. I do, but I should not own it now. So low was the soft reply he scarcely heard it, but he felt it and made a strong effort to break from the hateful spell that bound him. Leaning forward, he tried to read her face in a ray of moonlight breaking through the clouds. He saw a new and tender warmth in it, for all the pride was gone, and no fear marred the eloquence of those soft southern eyes. Kiss me, Rose, then I shall believe it. I feel lost in a dream, and you, so changed, so kind, may be only a fair phantom. Kiss me, love, and make it real. As if swayed by a power more potent than her will, Rose bent to meet his lips. But the ardent pressure seemed to startle her from a momentary oblivion of everything but love. She covered up her face and sank down, as if overwhelmed with shame, sobbing through passionate tears. Oh, what am I doing? I am mad, for I too have taken hashish. What he answered she never heard for a rattling peal of thunder drowned his voice, and then the storm broke loose. Rain fell in torrents, the wind blew fiercely, the sky and sea were black as ink, and the boat tossed from wave to wave, almost at their mercy. Giving herself up for lost, Rose crept to her lover's side and clung there, conscious only that they would bide together through the perils their own folly brought them. Dunn's excitement was quite gone now, He sat like a statue, shielding the frail creature whom he loved with a smile on his face, which looked awfully emotionless when the lightning gave her glimpses of its white immobility. Drenched, exhausted, and half senseless with danger, fear, and exposure, Rose saw at last a welcome glimmer through the gloom and roused herself to cry for help. Mark, wake and help me! Shout, for God's sake! Shout and call them, for we are lost if we drift by, she cried lifting his head from his breast and forcing him to see the brilliant beacons streaming far across the troubled water. He understood her, and springing up, uttered shout after shout like one demented. Fortunately, the storm had lulled a little. The lighthouse keeper heard and answered. Rose seized the helm, done the oars, and with one frantic effort guided the boat into quieter waters, where it was met by the keeper, who towed it to the rocky nook which served as harbor. The moment a strong, steady face met her eyes and a gruff, cheery voice hailed her, Rose gave way and was carried up to the house, looking more like a beautiful, drowned Ophelia than a living woman. Here, Sally, see to the poor thing. She's had a rough time on it. I'll take care of her sweetheart, and a nice job I'll have, I reckon. 
For if he ain't mad or drunk, he's had a stroke of lightning, and looks as if he wouldn't get his hearing in a hurry, said the old man, as he housed his unexpected guests, and stood staring at Dunn, who looked about him like one dazed. You just turn in yonder and sleep it off, mate. We'll see to the lady and ride up your boat in the morning, the old man added. Be kind to Rose. I frightened her. I'll not forget you. Yes, let me sleep and get over this cursed folly as soon as possible, muttered this strange visitor. Dunn threw himself down on the rough couch and tried to sleep, but every nerve was overstrained, every pulse beating like a trip hammer, and everything about him was intensified and exaggerated with awful power. The thunder shower seemed a wild hurricane, the quaint room a wilderness peopled with tormenting phantoms, and all the events of his life passed before him in an endless procession which nearly maddened him. The old man looked weird and gigantic, his own voice sounded shrill and discordant, and the ceaseless murmur of Rose's incoherent wanderings haunted him like parts of a grotesque but dreadful dream. All night he lay motionless, with staring eyes, feverish lips, and a mind on the rack, for the delicate machinery which had been tampered with revenged the wrong by torturing the foolish experimenter. All night Rose wept and sang, talked and cried for help in a piteous state of nervous excitement, for with her the trance came first, and the after agitation was increased by the events of the evening. She slept at last, lulled by the old woman's motherly care, and Dunn was spared one tormenting fear, for he dreaded the consequences of this folly on her more than upon himself. As day dawned, he rose, haggard and faint, and staggered out. At the door he met the keeper, who stopped him to report that the boat was in order and a fair Fair day day coming. Seeing doubt and perplexity in the old man's eyes, Dunn told him the truth and added that he was going to the beach for a plunge, hoping by that simple tonic to restore his unstrung nerves. He came back feeling like himself again, except for a dull headache and a heavy sense of remorse weighing on his spirits, for he distinctly recollected all the events of the night. The old woman made him eat and drink, and in an hour he felt ready for the homeward trip. Rose slept late, and when she woke, soon recovered herself, for her dose had been a small one. When she had breakfasted and made a hasty toilet, she professed herself anxious to return at once. She dreaded yet longed to see Dunn, and when the time came, armed herself with pride, feeling all a woman's shame at what had passed, and resolving to feign forgetfulness of the incidents of the previous night. Pale and cold as a statue, she met him. But the moment he began to say humbly, I'm sorry. Forgive me, Rose. She silenced him with an imperious gesture in the command. Don't speak of it. I only remember that it was very horrible and wish to forget it all as soon as possible. All? All, Rose, he asked significantly. All? Yes, all. No one would care to recall the follies of a hashish dream, she answered, turning hastily to hide the scarlet flush that would rise and the eyes that would fall before his own. I can never forget, but I will be silent if you bid me. I do. Let us go. What will they think at the island? Mr. Dunn, give me your promise to tell no one, now or ever, that I tried that dangerous experiment. I will guard your secret also. She spoke eagerly and looked up imploringly. I promise, and he gave her his hand, holding her own with a wistful glance, till she drew it away and begged him to take her home. Please, let's go now. Leaving hearty thanks and a generous token of their gratitude, they sailed away with a fair wind, finding in the freshness of the morning a speedy cure for tired bodies and excited minds. They said little, but it was impossible for Rose to preserve her coldness. The memory of the past night broke down her pride, and Dunn's tender glances touched her heart. She half hid her face behind her hand and tried to compose herself for the scene to come, for as she approached the island, she saw Belle and her party waiting for them on the shore. Oh, Mr. Dunn, screen me from their eyes and questions as much as you can. I'm so worn out and nervous. I shall betray myself. You will help me? And she turned to him with a confiding look, strangely at variance with her usual calm self-possession. I'll shield you with my life 
If you tell me why you took the hashish, she said, bent on knowing his fate. I hoped it would make me soft and lovable like other women. I'm tired of being a lonely statue, she faltered, as if the truth was wrung from her by a power stronger than her will. And I took it to gain courage to tell my love. Rose, we have been near death together. Let us share life together, and neither of us be any more lonely or afraid. He stretched his hand to her with his heart in his face, and she gave him hers with a look of tender submission, as he said ardently, Heaven bless hashish if its dreams end like this. This reading is from the Book of the One Thousand Nights and a Night, as translated by Sir Richard Burton, published in 1885. The tales are told each evening by Scheherazade as a ploy to prevent her execution by her husband, King. Burton's introduction creates the scene. This work, laborious as it may appear, has been to me a labor of love, an unfailing source of solace and satisfaction. During my long years of official banishment to the luxuriant and deadly deserts of Western Africa and to the dull and dreary half-clearings of South America, it proved itself a charm, a talisman against ennui and despondency. Impossible even to open the pages without a vision starting into view, without drawing a picture from the pinacotec of the brain, without reviving a host of memories and reminiscences which are not the common property of travelers, however widely they may have traveled. From my dull and commonplace and respectable surroundings, the jinn bore me at once to the land of my predilection, Arabia, a region so familiar to my mind that even at first sight it seemed a reminiscence of some bygone metempsychic life in the distant past. Again I stood under the diaphanous skies, in air glorious as ether, whose every breath raises men's spirit like sparkling wine. Once more I saw the evening star hanging like a solitaire from the pure front of the western firmament, and the afterglow transfiguring and transforming, as if by magic, the homely and rugged features of the scene into a fairyland lit with a light which never shines on other soils or seas. Then would appear the woolen tents, low and black, of the true Bedouin, mere dots in the boundless waste of lion-tawny clays and gazelle-brown gravels, and the campfire dotting like a glowworm the village center. Presently, sweetened by distance, would be heard the wild, weird songs of lads and lasses, driving, or rather pelting, through the gloaming their sheep and goats, and the measured chant of the spearsmen gravelly stalking behind their charge, the camels, mingled with the bleating of the flocks and the bellowing of the humpy herds, while the rear mouse flitted overhead with his tiny shriek and the rave of the jackal resounded through deepening glooms. And, most musical of music, the palm trees answered the whispers of the night breeze with the softest tones of falling water. The story of the 250th night and the notes that follow reveal some of the medicinal uses of cannabis and other herbs. Quoth King Sharyar, O Shaharazad, this is indeed a most wonderful tale. And she answered, O King, it is not more wonderful than the tale of Allah al-Din Abu al-Shamat. What is that? asked he. And she said, It hath reached me that there lived, in times of yore and years and ages long gone before, a merchant of Cairo named Shams al-Din, who was of the best and truest spoken of the traders of the city, 
and he had eunuchs and servants and negro slaves and handmaids and mamelukes and great store of money. Moreover, he was consul of the merchants of Cairo and owned a wife whom he loved and who loved him, except that he had lived with her forty years, yet had not been blessed with a son or even a daughter. One day, as he sat in his shop, he noted that the merchants, each and every, had a son or two sons or more sitting in their shops like their sons. Now the day being Friday, he entered the hammam bath and made the total ablution, after which he came out and took the barber's glass and looked in it, saying, I testify that there is no God but the God, and I testify that Muhammad is the messenger of God. Then he considered his beard, and seeing that the white hairs in it covered the black, he thought himself that hoariness is the harbinger of death. Now his wife knew the time of his coming home, and had washed and made herself ready for him. So when he came in to her, she said, Good evening. Good evening. But he replied, I see no good. Then she called to the handmaid, Spread the supper tray. And when this was done, quoth she to her husband, Sup, O my lord. Quoth he, I will eat nothing. And pushing the tray away with his foot, turned his back upon her. She asked, Why dost thou thus? And what hath vexed thee? Thou and he answered, Thou art the cause of my vexation. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the two hundred and fiftieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Shams al Din said to his wife, Thou art the cause of my vexation. And she asked, Wherefore? And he answered, when I opened my shop this morning, I saw that each and every of the merchants had with him a son, or two sons, or more, sitting in their shops like their fathers. And I said to myself, He who took thy sire will not spare thee. Now the night I first visited thee, thou madest me swear that I would never take a second wife over thee, nor a concubine, Abyssinian, or Greek, or handmaid of other race, nor would lie a single night away from thee, and behold, Thou art barren, and having thee is like boring into rock. Rejoined she, Allah is my witness that the fault lies with thee, for that thy seed is thin. He asked, And what showeth the man whose semen is thin? And she answered, He cannot get women with child, nor beget children. Quoth he, What thickeneth the seed? Tell me, and I will buy it. Haply it will thicken mine. Quoth she, Inquire for it of the druggists. So he slept with her that night, and arose on the morrow, repenting of having spoken angrily to her, and she also regretted her cross words. Then he went to the market, and finding a druggist, saluted him, and when his salutation was returned, said to him, Say, hast thou with thee a seed thickener? He replied, I had it, but am out of it. Inquire thou of my neighbor. Then Shams al-Din made the round till he had asked everyone, but they all laughed at him, and presently he returned to his shop and sat down, sorely troubled. Now there was in the bazaar a man who was deputy syndic of the brokers, and was given to the use of opium, and a lectuary, and green hashish. He was called Sheikh Mohammed Samsam, and being poor he used to wish Shams al-Din good morrow every day. So he came to him, according to his custom, and saluted him. The merchant returned his salute, but in ill temper, and the other, seeing him vexed, said, O oh my lord, what hath crossed thee? Thereupon Shams al-Din told him all that had occurred between himself and his wife, adding, These forty years I have been married to her, yet hath she borne me neither son nor daughter. And they say, The cause of thy failure to get her with child is the thinness of thy seed. So I have been seeking a something wherewith to thicken my semen, but not found it. Quoth Sheikh Muhammad, O my lord, I have a seed thickener, but what wilt thou say to him who causeth thy wife to conceive by thee after these forty years have passed? Answered the merchant, If thou do this, I will work thy wheel and reward thee. Then give me a dinar, rejoined the broker, and Shams al-Din said, Take these two dinars. He took them and said, Give me also yonder big bowl of porcelain. 
So he gave it to him, and the broker betook himself to a hashish seller, of whom he bought two ounces of concentrated rumi opium and equal parts of Chinese cubebs, cinnamon, cloves, cardamoms, ginger, white pepper, and mountain skink, a lizard, and pounding them all together, boiled them in sweet olive oil, after which he added three ounces of male frankincense in fragments and a couple of coriander seeds, and macerating the whole, made it into an electuary with roomy bee honey. Then he put the confection in the bowl and carried it to the merchant, to whom he delivered it, saying, Here is the seed thickener, and the manner of using it is this. Take of my electuary with a spoon after supping, and wash it down with a sherbet made of rose conserve, but first sup off mutton and house pigeon, plentifully seasoned and hotly spiced. So the merchant bought all this and sent the meat and pigeons to his wife, saying, Dress them deftly and lay up the seed thickener until I want it and call for it. She did his bidding, and when she served up the meats, he ate the evening meal, after which he called for the bowl and ate of the electuary. Mm -hmm. Mm. It pleased him very well, so he ate the rest and knew his wife. Mm. That very night she conceived by him, and after three months her courses ceased, no blood came, and she knew that she was with child. When the days of her pregnancy were accomplished, the pangs of labor took her, and they raised loud lullalooings and cries of joy. The midwife delivered her with difficulty by pronouncing over the boy at his birth the names of Muhammad and Ali, and said, Allah is most great, and she called in his ear the call to prayer. Then she wrapped him up and passed him to his mother, who took him and gave him the breast, and he sucked and was full and slept. The midwife abode with them three days till they had made the mothering cakes of sugared bread and sweetmeats, and they distributed them on the seventh day. Then they sprinkled salt against the evil eye, and the merchant, going in to his wife, gave her joy of her safe delivery, and said, Where is Allah's deposit? So they brought him a babe of surpassing beauty, the handiwork of the orderer who is ever present. And though he was but seven days old, those who saw him would have deemed him a yearling child. So the merchant looked on his face, and seeing it like a shining full moon, with moles on either cheek, said he to his wife, What hast thou named him? Answered she, If it were a girl, I had named her, but this is a boy, so none shall name him but thou. Now the people of that time used to name their children by omens, and whilst the merchant and his wife were taking counsel of the name, behold, one said to his friend, Ho, oh, my lord, Aladdin. So the merchant said, We will call him Aladdin Nabu al Shamat. Some other recipes Burton refers to follow. In India, hashish is called majun, electuary generally. It is made of ganja, or young leaves, buds, capsules, and florets of hemp, poppy seed, and flowers of the thorn apple, or datura, with milk and sugar candy, nutmegs, cloves, mace, and saffron, all boiled to the consistency of treacle, which hardens when cold. Several recipes are given by hair cloths. These electuaries are usually prepared with charas, or gum of hemp, collected by hand or by passing a blanket over the plant in early morning, and it is highly intoxicating. Another intoxicant is sabzi, dried hemp leaves, poppy seed, cucumber seed, black pepper, and cardamoms, rubbed down in a mortar with a wooden pestle, made drinkable by adding milk, ice cream, etc., the hashish of Arabia is the Hindustani bang, usually drunk and made as follows. A cake of hemp leaves, well washed, three drams, black pepper, 45 grains, and of cloves, nutmeg, and mace, which add to the intoxication, each 12 grains. Steep in eight ounces of water or the juice of watermelon or cucumber, strain and drink. The Egyptian zabiba is a preparation of hemp florets, opium, and honey, much affected by the lower orders, whence the proverb, temper thy sorrow with sabiba. In all hijaz, it is mixed with raisins and smoked in the water pipe. 
Besides these are 1. Post poppy seeds, prepared in various ways but especially in sugared sherbets. 2. The Taurus Ramonium seed, the produce of the thorn apple, bleached and put into sweetmeats by dishonest confectioners. It is a dangerous intoxicant, producing spectral visions, delirium tremens, etc. And 3. Various preparations of opium, especially the madad, pills made up with toasted beetle leaf and smoked. The Victorian fascination with the archetypal garden, which embraced the Arabic garden tradition, is reflected in this descriptive passage, A Cannabis Dream Come True. This is Baghdad, and tis the city where security is to be had. Winter with his frosts hath turned away, and prime hath come his roses to display. And the flowers are glowing, and the trees are blowing, and the streams are flowing. So Nur al-Din landed, he and his handmaid, and giving the captain five dinars, walked on a little way till the decrees of destiny brought them among the gardens, and they came to a place swept and sprinkled with benches along the walls and hanging jars filled with water. Overhead was a trellis of reed work and canes shading the whole length of the avenue, and at the upper end was a garden gate, but this was locked. By Allah, quoth Nur al -Din to the damsel, right pleasant is this place. And she replied, O oh, my lord, sit with me a while on this bench, and let us take our ease. So they mounted and sat themselves down on the bench, after which they washed their faces and hands, and the breeze blew cool on them, and they fell asleep, and glory be to him who never sleepeth. Now this garden was named the Garden of Gladness, and therein stood the Palace of Pleasure and the Pavilion of Pictures, the whole belonging to the Caliph Harun al-Rashid, who was wont, when his breast was straightened with care, to frequent garden and palace and there to sit. The, pa the palace had eighty latticed windows and fourscore lamps hanging round a great candelabrum of gold furnished with wax candles. And when the caliph used to enter, he would order the handmaids to throw lights. open the lattices and light up the rooms. And he would bid Ishak bin Ibrahim, the and cup companion, music. and the slave girls to sing till his breast was broadened and his ailments were allayed. Now the keeper of the garden, Sheikh Ibrahim, was a very old man, and he had found from time to time, when he went out on any business, people pleasuring about the garden gate with their bona robas at which he was angered with exceeding anger. But he took patience till one day when the caliph came to his garden, and he complained of this to Harun al-Rashid, who said, Whomsoever thou surprisest about the door of the garden, deal with him as thou wilt. Now on this day the gardener chanced to be abroad on some occasion, and returning found these two sleeping at the gate, covered with a single mantilla. Whereupon he said, By Allah, good! These twain know not that the caliph hath given me leave to slay any one I may catch at the door, but I will give this couple a shrewd whipping, that none may come near the gate in the future. So he cut a green palm frond, and went up to them, and raising his arm till the white of his armpit appeared, was about to strike them, when he bethought himself and said, O oh, Ibrahim. Oh, Ibrahim, wilt thou beat them unknowing their case? Haply they are strangers, or sons of the road, and the decrees of destiny have thrown them here. I will uncover their faces and look at them. So he lifted up the mantilla from their heads and said, They are a handsome they couple. Handsome. It were not fitting that I should beat them. Then he covered their faces again, and going to Nur al-Din's feet, began to rub and shampoo them, whereupon the youth opened his eyes, and seeing an old man of grave and reverend aspect, rubbing his feet, he was ashamed and drawing them in, sat up. Then he took Sheikh Ibrahim's hand and kissed it. Quoth the old man, O my son, whence art my thou? Son. And quoth he, O my lord, we are two strangers. strangers. And the tears started from his eyes. O my son, said Sheikh Ibrahim, know that the prophet, whom Allah bless and preserve, hath enjoined honor to the honor. stranger, and added, Wilt thou not arise, O my son, arise, and pass into the garden, and solace thyself 
by looking at it and gladden thy heart. O oh, my lord, said Nur al-Din, to whom doth this garden belong? And the other replied, O oh, my son, I have inherited it from my folk. Now his object in saying this was to set them at their ease and induce them to enter the garden. So Nur al-Din thanked him and rose, he and the damsel, and followed him into the garden. And lo, it was a garden, and what a garden! The gate was arched like a great hall, and over walls and roof ramped vines with grapes of many colors, the red like rubies and the black like ebonies, and beyond it lay a bower of trellised boughs growing fruit single and composite, and small birds on branches sang with melodious recite. And the thousand-noted nightingale shrilled with her varied shrite, and the turtle with her cooing filled the sight. The blackbird whistled like a magical white, and the ring-dove moaned like a drinker in grievous plight. The trees grew in perfection all edible growths, and fruited all manner fruits which in pairs were bipartite, with the camphor apricot, the almond apricot, and the apricot corasani height. The plum, like the face of beauty, smooth and bright. The cherry that makes teeth shine clear by her slight. And the fig of three colors, green, purple, and white. There also blossomed the violet, as it were sulfur on fire by night. The orange with buds like pink coral and marguerite. The rose whose redness gars the loveliest cheeks, blushed with despite. And myrtle and gilliflower and lavender with the red blood anemone from Numan height. The leaves were all gemmed with tears the clouds had dyed. The chamomile smiled, showing teeth that bite, and Narcissus, with his negro eyes, fixed on rose his sight. The citrons shone with fruits emboweled, and the lemons like balls of gold. The earth was carpeted with flowers tinctured infinite, for spring has come, brightening the place with joy and delight and the streams ran ringing to the birds' gay singing, while the rustling breeze upspringing attempered the air to temperance exquisite. <laughs> Sheikh Ibrahim carried them up into the pavilion, and they gazed on its beauty, and on the lamps aforementioned in the latticed windows. And Nur al-Din, remembering his entertainments of time past, cried, By Allah, this is a pleasant place. It hath quenched in me anguish, which burned as a fire of Gaza wood. This reading is from the Hashish Eater or Passages from the Life of a Pythagorean by Fitzhugh Ludlow, published in 1857 by Harper and Brothers, New York. This was the first of the American hashish uh, exposés, and many feel the best. And what I'm going to read this morning out of a very rich potential group of readings is Fitzhugh Ludlow's description of his first encounter with the power of cannabis. <clears throat> so I begin the reading partway through the chapter called The Night Entrance. One morning in the spring of 1850-something, I dropped in upon the doctor for my accustomed lounge. Have you seen, Welcome. said he, seen my new seen. acquisitions? Yes. I Look. looked toward the shelves in the direction of which he pointed and saw, added since my last visit, a row of comely pasteboard mm. cylinders enclosing vials of the various extracts prepared by Tilden and Company. Arranged in order according to their size, they confronted me as pretty a rank of medicinal sharpshooters as could gratify the eye of an amateur. I approached the shelves that I might take them in review. A rapid glance showed most of them to be old acquaintances. Conium, taraxicum, rhubarb. Ha, what is this? Cannabis indica? 
That, answered the doctor, looking with a parental fondness upon his new treasure, is a preparation of the East Indian hemp, a powerful agent in cases of lockjaw. On the strength of this introduction, I took down the little archer and, removing his outer verdant coat, began the further prosecution of his acquaintance. To pull out a broad and shallow cork was the work of an instant, and it revealed to me an olive-brown extract of the consistency of pitch and a decided aromatic odor. Drawing out a small portion upon the point of my penknife, I was just going to put it to my tongue when... Hold on, cried the doctor. Do you want to kill yourself? That stuff is deadly poison. Indeed, I replied. No, I cannot say that I have any settled determination of that kind. And with that, I replaced the cork and restored the extract with all its appurtenances to the shelf. The remainder of my morning's visit in the sanctum was spent consulting the dispensatory under the title Cannabis Indica. The sum of my discoveries there may be found with much additional information in that invaluable popular work, Johnston's Chemistry of Common Life. This being universally accessible, I will allude no further to the result of that morning's researches than to mention the three following conclusions to which I came. First, the doctor was both right and wrong, right inasmuch as a sufficiently large dose of the drug, if it could be retained in the stomach, would produce death like any other narcotic, and the ultimate effect of its habitual use had always proved highly injurious to mind and body. Wrong, since moderate doses of it were never immediately deadly, and many millions of people daily employed it as an indulgence similarly to opium. Second, it was the hashish referred to by Eastern travelers and the subject of a most graphic chapter from the pen of Bayard Taylor, which months before had moved me powerfully to curiosity and admiration. Third, I would add it to the list of my former experiences. In pursuance of this last determination, I waited till my friend was out of sight, that I might not terrify him by that which he considered a suicidal venture, and then, quickly uncapping my little archer a second time, removed from his store of offensive armor a pill sufficient to balance the ten-grain weight of the sanctorial scales. This, upon the authority of Pereira and the dispensatory, I swallowed without a tremor as to the danger of the result. Making all due allowance for the fact that I had not taken my hashish bolus fasting, I ought to experience it, its effects within the next four hours. That time elapsed without bringing the shadow of a phenomenon. It was plain that my dose had been insufficient. For the sake of observing the most conservative prudence, I suffered several days to go by without a repetition of the experiment, and then, keeping the matter equally secret, I administered to myself a pill of fifteen grains. This second was equally ineffectual with the first. Gradually, by five grains at a time, I increased the dose to thirty grains, which I took one evening half an hour after tea. I had now almost come to the conclusion that I was absolutely unsusceptible of the hashish influence. Without any expectation that this last experiment would be more successful than the former ones, and indeed with no realization of the manner in which the drug affected those who did make the experiment successfully, I went to pass the evening at the house of an intimate friend. In music and conversation, the time passed pleasantly. The clock struck ten, reminding me that three hours had elapsed since the dose was taken, and as yet not an unusual symptom had appeared. I was provoked to think that this trial was as fruitless as its predecessors. Ah, what means this sudden thrill? A shock as of some unimagined vital force shoots without warning through my entire frame, leaping to my fingers' ends, piercing my brain, startling me till I almost spring from my chair. I, I could not doubt it. 
I was in the power of the hashish influence. My first emotion was one of uncontrollable terror, a sense of getting something which I had not bargained for. That moment I would have given all I had or hoped to have to be as I was three hours before. No pain anywhere, not a twinge in any fiber, yet a cloud of unutterable strangeness was settling upon me and wrapping me impenetrably in from all that was natural or familiar. Endeared faces well known to me of old surrounded me, and yet they were not with me in my loneliness. I had entered upon a tremendous life which they could not share. If the disembodied ever return to hover over the hearthstone which once had a seat for them, they look upon their friends as I then looked upon mine. A nearness of place, with an infinite distance of state, a connection which had no possible sympathies for the wants of that hour of revelation, an isolation nonetheless perfect for seeming companionship. Still, I spoke. A question was put to me, and I answered it. I even laughed at a bon mot. Yet it was not my voice which spoke, perhaps one which I once had far away in another time and another place. For a while I knew nothing that was going on externally, and then the remembrance of the last remark which had been made returned slowly and indistinctly as some trait of a dream will return after many days, puzzling us to say where we have been conscious of it before. A fitful wind all the evening had been sighing down the chimney. Now it grew into the steady hum of a vast wheel in accelerating motion. For a while this hum seemed to resound through all space. I was stunned by it. I was absorbed in it. Slowly the revolution of the wheel came to a stop, and its monotonous din was changed for the reverberating peal of a grand cathedral organ. The ebb and flow of its inconceivably solemn tone filled me with a grief that was more than human. I sympathized with the dirge-like cadence as spirit sympathizes with spirit, and then, in the full conviction that all I heard and felt was real, I looked out of my isolation to see the effect of the music on my friends. Ah, we were in separate worlds indeed, not a trace of appreciation on any face. Perhaps I was acting strangely. Suddenly a pair of busy hands which had been running neck and neck all the evening with a nimble little crochet needle over a race ground of pink and blue silk stopped at their goal and their owner looked at me steadfastly. Ah, oh, I was found out. I had betrayed myself. In terror I waited, expecting every instant to hear the word hashish. No, uh, the lady only asked me some question connected with the previous conversation. Uh, as mechanically as an automaton, I began to reply, as I heard once more the alien and unreal tones of my own voice, I became convinced that it was someone else who spoke, and in another world. I sat and listened. Still the voice kept speaking. Now, for the first time, I experienced the vast change which Hashish makes in all measurements of time. The first word of the reply occupied a period sufficient for the action of a drama. The last left me in complete ignorance of any point far enough back in the past to date the commencement of the sentence. Its enunciation might have occupied years. I was not in the same life which had held me when I heard it begun. And now, with time, space expanded also. At my friend's house, one particular armchair was always reserved for me. I was sitting in it at a distance of hardly three feet from the center table around which the members of the family were grouped. Rapidly, that distance widened. The whole atmosphere seemed ductile and spun endlessly out into great spaces surrounding me on every side. We were in a vast hall of which my friends and I occupied opposite extremities. The ceiling and the walls ran upward with a gliding motion as if vivified by a sudden force of resistless growth. Oh, I could not bear it. I should soon be left alone in the midst of an infinity of space. And now, more and more, every moment increased the conviction that I was watched. I did 
did not know then, as I learned afterwards, that suspicion of all earthly things and persons was the characteristic of the hashish delirium. In the midst of my complicated hallucination, I could perceive that I had a dual existence. One portion of me was whirled unresistingly along the track of this tremendous experience. The other sat looking down from a height upon its double, observing, reasoning, and serenely weighing all the phenomena. This calmer being suffered with the other by sympathy, but did not lose its self-possession. Presently it warned me that I must go home, lest the growing effect of the hashish should incite me to some act which might frighten my friends. I acknowledged the force of this remark very much as if it had been made by another person, and rose to take my leave. I advanced toward the center table. With every step its distance increased. I nerved myself as for a long pedestrian journey. Still, the lights, the faces, the furniture receded. At last, almost unconsciously, I reached them. It would be tedious to attempt to convey the idea of the time which my leave-taking consumed, and the attempt, at least with all minds that have not passed through the same experience, it would be as impossible as tedious. At last, however, I was in the street. Beyond me, the view stretched endlessly away. It was an unconverging vista whose nearest lamps seemed separated from me by leagues. I was doomed to pass through a merciless stretch of space, a soul just disenthralled setting out for his flight beyond the furthest visible star could not be more overwhelmed with his newly acquired conception of the sublimity of distance than I was at that moment. Solemnly, I began my infinite journey. Before long, I walked in entire unconsciousness of all around me. I dwelt in a marvelous inner world. I existed by turns in different places and various states of being. Now I swept my gondola through the moonlit lagoons of Venice. Now Alp on Alp towered above my view, and the glory of the coming sun flashed purple light upon the topmost icy pinnacle. Now, in the primeval silence of some unexplored tropical forest, I spread my feathery leaves, a giant fern, and swayed and nodded in the spice gales over a river whose waves at once sent up clouds of music and perfume. My soul changed to a vegetable essence, thrilled with a strange and unimaginable ecstasy. The palace of Al-Harun could not have brought me back to humanity. I will not detail all the transmutations of that walk. Ever and anon I returned from my dreams into consciousness as some well-known house seemed to leap out into my path, awakening me with a shock. The whole way homeward was a series of such awakenings and relapses into abstraction and delirium until I reached the corner of the street in which I lived. Here, a new phenomenon manifested itself. I had just awakened for perhaps the twentieth time, and my eyes were wide open. I recognized all surrounding objects and began calculating the distance home. Suddenly, out of a blank wall at my side, a muffled figure stepped into the path before me. His hair, white as snow, hung in tangled elf locks on his shoulders, where he carried also a heavy burden, like unto the well-filled sack of sins which Bunyan places on the back of his pilgrim. Not liking his manner, I stepped aside, intending to pass around him and go on my way. This change of our relative position allowed the blaze of a neighboring streetlight to fall full on <gasps> his face, which had hitherto been totally obscured. Horror unspeakable. <laughs> I shall never, till the day I die, forget that face. Every liniment was stamped with the records of a life black with damning crime. It glared upon me with a ferocious wickedness and a stony despair which only he may feel who is entering on the retribution of the unpardonable sin. 
he might have sat to a demon painter as the ideal of Shelley's Senchi. I seemed to grow blasphemous in looking at him and, in an agony of fear, began to run away. He detained me with a bony hand which pierced my wrist like talons and slowly taking down the burden from his own shoulders laid it upon mine. I threw it off and pushed him away. Silently he returned and restored the weight. Again I repulsed him, this time crying out, Man, what do you mean? What do you mean? In a voice which impressed me with the sense of wickedness as his face had done, he replied, You shall bear bear my my burden with me. And a third time laid it on my shoulders. For the last time I hurled it aside and with all my force dashed him from me. He reeled backward and fell, and before he could recover his disadvantage, I had put a long distance between us. Through the excitement of my struggle with this phantasm, the effects of the hashish had increased mightily. I was bursting with an uncontrollable life. I strode with the thews of a giant. Hotter and faster came my breath. I seemed to pant like some tremendous engine. An electric energy whirled me resistlessly onward. I feared for myself lest it should burst its fleshy walls and glance on, leave a wreck of framework behind it. At last, I entered my own house. During my absence, a family connection had arrived from abroad and stood ready to receive my greeting. Partly restored to consciousness by the naturalness of home faces and the powerful light of a chandelier which shed its blaze through the room, I saw the necessity of vigilance against betraying my condition, and, with an intense effort suppressing all I felt, I approached my friend and said all that is usual on such occasions. Yet, recent as I was from my conflict with the supernatural, I cast a stealthy look about me that I might learn from the faces of others if, after all, I was shaking hands with a phantom and making inquiries about the health of a family of hallucinations. Growing assured, as I perceived no symptoms of astonishment, I finished the salutation and sat down. It soon required all my resolution to keep the secret which I had determined to hold inviolable. My sensations began to be terrific, not from any pain that I felt, but from the tremendous mystery of all around me and within me. By an appalling introversion, all the operations of vitality, which in our ordinary state go on unconsciously, came vividly into my experience. Through every thinnest corporeal tissue and minutest vein, I could see the circulation of the blood along each inch of its progress. I knew when every valve opened and when it shut. Every sense was preternaturally awakened. The room was full of a great glory. The beating of my heart was so clearly audible that I wondered to find it unnoticed by those who were sitting by my side. Lo, now the heart became a great fountain whose jet played upward with loud vibrations and a striking upon the roof of my skull as on a gigantic dome fell back with a splash and echo into its reservoir. Faster and faster came the pulsations until at last I heard them no more and the stream became one continuously pouring flood whose roar resounded through all my frame. I gave myself up the rest, since judgment, which still sat unimpaired above my perverted senses, argued that congestion must take place in a few moments and close the drama with my death. But my clutch would not yet relax from hope. The thought struck me, might not this rapidity of circulation be, after all, imaginary? I determined to find out. Going to my own room, I took out my watch and placed my hand upon my heart. The very effort which I made to ascertain the reality gradually brought perception back to its normal state. In the intensity of my observations, I began to perceive that the circulation was not as rapid as I had thought. From a pulseless flow, it gradually came to be apprehended as a hurrying succession of intense throbs, then less swift and less intense, till finally, on comparing it with the second hand, I found that about ninety a minute was its average rapidity. Greatly comforted, I desisted from the experiment. Almost instantly, the hallucination returned. 
Again, I dreaded apoplexy, congestion, hemorrhage, and a multiplicity of nameless deaths, and drew my picture as I might be found on the morrow, stark and cold, by those whose agony would be redoubted by the mystery of my end. I reasoned with myself. I bathed my forehead. It did no good. There was one resource left. I would go to a physician. With this resolve, I left my room and went to the head of the staircase. The family had all retired for the night, and the gas was turned off from the burner in the hall below. I looked down the stairs. The depth was fathomless. It was a journey of years to reach the bottom. The dim light of the sky shone through the narrow panes at the sides of the front door and seemed a demon light in the middle darkness of the abyss. I never could get down. I sat me down despairingly upon the topmost step. Suddenly a sublime thought possessed me. If the distance be infinite, I am immortal. It shall be tried. I commenced the descent wearily, wearily down through my league-long, year-long journey. To record my impressions in that journey would be to repeat what I have said of the time of Hashish. Now stopping to rest as a traveler would turn aside at a wayside inn, now toiling down through the lonely darkness, I came by and by to the end and passed out into the street. Chapter 2 Under the Shadow of Esculapius on reaching the porch of the physician's house, I rang the bell, but immediately forgot whom to ask for. No wonder I was on the steps of a palace in Milan. No, and I laughed to myself for the blunder. I was on the staircase of the Tower of London, so I should not be puzzled through my ignorance of Italian. But whom to ask for? This question recalled me to the real bearings of the place, but did not suggest its requisite answer. Whom should I ask for? I began setting the most cunning traps of hypothesis to catch the solution of the difficulty. I looked at the surrounding houses. Of whom had I been accustomed to think as living next door to them? This did not bring it. Whose daughter had I not seen going to school from this house but the very day before? Her name was Julia. Julia. And I thought of every combination which had been made with this name from Julia Domna down to Julia Gristi. Ah, now I had it. Uh, Julia H. And her father naturally bore the same name. Uh, during this intellectual rummage, I had rung the bell half a dozen times under the impression that I was kept waiting a small eternity. When the servant opened the door, she panted as if she had run for her life. I was shown upstairs to Dr. H.'s room, where he had thrown himself down to rest after a tedious operation, locking the door after me with an air of determined secrecy, which must have conveyed to him pleasant little suggestions of a design upon his life. I approached his bedside. Mm, uh, I am about to reveal to you, I commenced, uh, something which uh, I would not for my life allow to come to other ears. Uh, do you pledge me your eternal silence? I do. What's the matter? Uh, I, uh, I have been taking hashish, uh, cannabis indica, and I fear that I am now going to die. How much did you take? Uh, Thirty grains. Let me feel your pulse. He placed his finger on my wrist and counted slowly while I stood waiting to hear my death warrant. Uh, very regularly, shortly spoke the doctor, triflingly accelerated. Do you feel any pain? Uh, none at all. Nothing the matter with you. Go home and go to bed. But uh, is there, is there uh, no, no danger of apoplexy? Bah, said the doctor, and having delivered himself of this very Abernathy-like opinion in my case, he lay down again. My hand was on the knob when he stopped me with, Wait a minute. I'll give you a powder to carry with you, and if you get frightened again after you leave me, you can take it as a sedative. Step out on the landing, if you please, and call my servant. I did so, and my voice seemed to reverberate like thunder from every recess of the whole building. I was terrified at the noise I had made. I learned in after days that this impression is only one of the many due to the intense susceptibility of the sensorium as produced by hashish. 
at one time having asked a friend to check me if I talked loudly or immoderately while in a state of fantasia among persons from whom I wished to conceal my state, I caught myself shouting and singing from very ecstasy and reproached him with the neglect of his friendly office. I could not believe him when he assured me that I had not uttered an audible word. The intensity of the inward emotion had affected the external through the internal ear. I returned and stood at the foot of the doctor's bed. All was perfect silence in the room, and had been perfect darkness also, but for the small lamp which I held in my hand to light the preparation of the powder when it should come. And now a still sublimer mystery began to enwrap me. I stood in a remote chamber at the top of a colossal building, and the whole fabric beneath me was steadily growing into the air, higher than the topmost pinnacle of Bell's Babylonish temple, higher than Ararat, on, on forever into the lonely dome of God's infinite universe, we towered ceaselessly. The years flew on. I heard the musical rush of their wings in the abyss outside of me, and from cycle to cycle, from life to life, I careened a moat in eternity and space. Suddenly, emerging from the orbit of my transmigrations, I was again at the foot of the doctor's bed, and thrilled with wonder to find that we were both unchanged by the measureless lapse of time. The servant had not come. Uh, shall I call her again? Why, you have this moment called her. Doctor, I replied solemnly, and in language that would have seemed bombastic enough to anyone who did not realize what I felt, I will not believe you are deceiving me, but to me it appears as if sufficient time has elapsed from then since for all the pyramids to have crumbled back to dust. Ha <laughs> ha! You're very funny tonight, said the doctor. But here she comes, and I will send her for something that will comfort you on that score and reestablish the pyramids in your confidence. He gave the girl his orders, and she went out again. Oh. The thought struck me that I would compare my time with other people's. I looked at my watch, found that its minute hand stood at the quarter mark past eleven, and returning it to my pocket, abandoned myself to my reflections. Presently I saw myself a gnome imprisoned by a most weird enchanter, whose part I assigned to the doctor before me in the Dom Daniel caverns under the roots of the ocean. Here, until the dissolution of all things, was I doomed to hold the lamp that lit the abysmal darkness, while my heart, like a giant clock, ticked solemnly the remaining years of time. Now, this hallucination departing, I heard in the solitude of the now night outside the sound of a wondrous heaving sea. Its waves in sublime cadence rolled forward till they met the foundations of the building. They smote them with a might which made the very top stone quiver and then fell back with hiss and hollow murmur into the broad bosom whence they had arisen. Now, through the street with measured tread an armed host passed by. The heavy beat of their footfall and the girding of their brazen corslet rings alone broke the silence. For among them all there was no more speech, no music than in a battalion of the dead. It was the army of the ages going by into eternity. A godlike sublimity swallowed up my soul. I was overwhelmed in a fathomless baranth room of time, and I leaned on God and was immortal through all changes. And now, in another life, I remembered that far back in the cycles I had looked at my watch to measure the time through which I passed. The impulse seized me to look again. The minute hand stood halfway between fifteen and sixteen minutes past eleven. The watch must have stopped. I held it to my ear. No, no, it was still going. I had traveled through all that immeasurable chain of dreams in thirty seconds. My God, I cried, I am in eternity. Of that first sublime revelation of the soul's own time and her capacity for an infinite life, 
I stood trembling, breathless awe. Till I die, that moment of unveiling will stand in clear relief from all the rest of my existence. I hold it still in unimpaired remembrance as one of the unutterable sanctities of my being. The years of all my earthly life to come can never be as long as those thirty seconds. Finally, the servant reappeared. I received my powder and went home. There was a light in one of the upper windows, and I hailed it with unspeakable joy, for it relieved me from a fear which I could not oh. conquer, that while I had been gone, all familiar things had passed away from earth. I was hardly safe in my room before I doubted having ever been out of it. I have experienced some wonderful dreams, said I, as I lay here after coming oh. home to If I had not been out, I reasoned I would have no powder in my pocket. The powder was there, and it steadied me little to find that I was not utterly hallucinated on every point. Leaving the light burning, I set out to travel to my bed, which gently invited me in the distance. Reaching it after a sufficient walk, I threw myself down. Chapter 3, The Kingdom of the Dream The moment that I closed my eyes, a vision of celestial glory burst upon me. I stood on the silver strand of a translucent, boundless lake, across whose bosom I seemed to have been just transported. A short way up the beach, a temple, modeled like the Parthenon, lifted its spotless and gleaming columns of alabaster sublimely into a rosy air like the Parthenon, yet as much excelling it as the godlike ideal of architecture must transcend that ideal realized by man. Unblemished in its purity of whiteness, faultless in the unbroken symmetry of every line and angle, its pediment was draped in odorous clouds whose tints outshone the rainbow. It was the work of an unearthly builder, and my soul stood before it in a trance of ecstasy. Its folded doors were resplendent with the glory of a multitude of eyes of glass, which were inlaid throughout the marble surfaces at the corners of diamond figures from the floor of the porch to the topmost molding. One of these eyes was golden like the midday sun, another emerald, another sapphire, and thus onward through the whole gamut of hues, all of them set in such collocations as to form most exquisite harmonies, and whirling upon their axes with the rapidity of thought. At the mere vestibule of the temple I could have sat and drunk in ecstasy forever, but lo, I am yet more blessed. On silent hinges the doors swing open and I pass in. I did not seem to be in the interior of a temple. I beheld myself as truly in the open air as if I had never passed the portals, for whichever way I looked there were no walls, no roof, no pavement, an atmosphere of fathomless and soul-satisfying serenity surrounded and transfused me. I stood upon the bank of a crystal stream whose waters, as they slid on, discoursed notes of music which tinkled on the ear like the tones of some exquisite bell glass. The same impression which such tones produce of music refined to its ultimate ethereal spirit and born from a far distance characterized every ripple of those translucent waves. The gently sloping banks of the stream were luxuriant with a velvety cushioning of grass and moss, so living green that the eye and the soul reposed on them at the same time and drank in peace. Through this amaranthine herbage strayed the gnarled, fantastic roots of giant cedars of Lebanon, from whose primeval trunks great branches spread above me, and interlocking wove a roof of impenetrable shadow, and wandering down the still avenues below those grand arboreal arches went glorious bards whose snowy beards fell on their breasts beneath countenances of ineffable benignity and nobleness. They were all clad in flowing robes like God's high priests, 
and each one held in his hand a lyre of unearthly workmanship. Presently one stops midway down a shady walk, and, bearing his right arm, begins a prelude. While his celestial chords were trembling up into their sublime fullness, another strikes his strings, and now they blend upon my ravished ear in such a symphony as was never heard elsewhere, and I shall never hear again out of the great presence. A moment more, and three are playing in harmony. Now the fourth joins the glorious rapture of his music to their own, and in the completeness of the chord my soul is swallowed up, I can bear no more, but yes, I am sustained, for suddenly the whole throng breaks forth in a chorus, upon whose wings I am lifted out of the riven walls of sense, and music and spirit thrill in immediate communion. Forever rid of the intervention of pulsing air and vibrating nerve, my soul dilates with the swell of that transcendent harmony and interprets from it arcana of a meaning which words can never tell. I am borne aloft upon the glory of sound. I float in a trance among the burning choir of the seraphim. But as I am melting through the purification of that sublime ecstasy into oneness with the deity himself, one by one those peeling lyres faint away. And as the last throb dies down along the measureless ether, visionless arms, swiftly as lightning, carry me far into the profound and set me down before another portal. Its leaves, like the first, are of spotless marble, but ungemmed with wheeling eyes of burning color. Before entering on the record of this new vision, I will make a digression for the purpose of introducing two laws of the hashish operation, which, as explicatory, deserve a place here. First, after the completion of any one fantasia has arrived, there almost invariably succeeds a shifting of the action to some other stage entirely different in its surroundings. In this transition, the general character of the emotion may remain unchanged. I may be happy in paradise and happy at the sources of the Nile, but seldom either in paradise or on the Nile, twice in succession. I may writhe in Etna and burn unquenchably in Gehana, but almost never in the course of the same delirium shall Etna or Gehana witness my torture a second time. Second, after the full storm of a ha vision of intense sublimity has blown past the hashish eater, his next vision is generally of a quiet, relaxing, and recreating nature. He comes down from his clouds or up from his abyss into a middle ground of gentle shadows where he may rest his eyes from the splendor of the seraphim or the flames of fiends. There is a wise philosophy in this arrangement, for otherwise the soul would soon burn out in the excess of its own oxygen. Many a time, it seems to me, has my own thus been saved from extinction. This next vision illustrated both, but especially the latter of these laws. The temple doors opened noiselessly before me, but it was no sense of sublimity which thus broke in upon my eyes. I stood in a large apartment which resembled the Senate chamber at Washington more than anything else to which I can compare it. Its roof was vaulted, and at the side opposite the entrance, the floor rose into a dais surrounded by a large armchair. The body of the house was occupied by similar chairs disposed in arcs. The heavy paneling of the walls was adorned with grotesque frescoes of every imaginable bird, beast, and monster, which, by some hidden law of life and motion, were forever changing, like the figures of the kaleidoscope. Now the walls bristled with hippographs. Now, from wainscot to ceiling, toucans and makatas swung and nodded from their perches amid emerald palms. Now centaurs and lepenthe clashed in ferocious tumult. 
while Crater and Cyanthus were crushed beneath ringing hoof and heel. But my attention was quickly distracted from the frescoes by the sight of a most witchly congress which filled all the chairs of that broad chamber. On the dais sat an old crone whose commanding position first engaged my attention to her personal appearance, and, upon rather impolite scrutiny, I beheld that she was the product of an art held in preeminent favor among persons of her age and sex. She was knit of purple yarn. In faultless order, the stitches ran along her face, in every pucker of her retrentant mouth, in every wrinkle of her brow. She was a yarny counterfeit of the grand dame of actual life, and by some skillful process of stuffing her nose, had received its due peak and her chin its projection. The occupants of the seats below were all but reproductions of their president. Both she and they were constantly swaying from side to side, forward and back, to the music of some invisible instruments whose tone and style were most intensely and ludicrously Ethiopian. Not a word was spoken by any of the woolly conclave, but with untiring industry they were all knitting, knitting, knitting ceaselessly as if their lives depended upon it. I looked to see the objects of their manufacture. They were knitting old women like themselves. One of the sisterhood had nearly brought her double to completion. Earnestly, another was engaged in rounding out an eyeball. Another was fastening the gathers at the corners of a mouth. Another was setting up stitches for an old woman in petto. With marvelous rapidity, this work went on. Ever and anon, some completed crone sprang from the needles which had just achieved her and instantly vivified, took up the instruments of reproduction and fell to work as assiduously as if she had been a member of the Congress since the world began. Here, I cried, here at last do I realize the meaning of endless progression. And through the dome echoed my peals of laughter. I saw no motion of astonishment in the stitches of a single face. But as for dear life, the manufacture of old women went on unobstructed by the involuntary rudeness of the stranger. An irresistible desire to aid in the work possessed me. I was half determined to snatch up a quartet of needles and join the sisterhood. My nose began to be ruffled with stitches, and the next moment I had been a partner in their yarny destinies, but for a hand which pulled me backward through the door and shut the Congress forever from my view. For a season I abode in an utter void of sight and sound, but I waited patiently in the assurance that some new changes of magnificence were preparing for me. I was not disappointed. Suddenly, at a far distance, three intense luminous points stood on the triple wall of darkness, and through each of them shot twin attenuated rays of magic light and music. Without being able to perceive anything of my immediate surroundings, I still felt that I was noiselessly drifting toward those radiant and vocal points. With every moment they grew larger, the light and the harmony came clearer, and before long I could distinguish plainly three colossal arches rising from the bosom of a waveless water. The mid-arch towered highest, the two on either side were equal to each other. Presently I beheld that they formed the portals of an enormous cavern whose dome rose above me into such sublimity that its cope was hidden from my eyes in wreaths of cloud. On each side of me ran a wall of gnarled and rugged rock from whose jutting points as high as the eye could reach depended stalactites of every imagined form and tinge of beauty while below me, in the semblance of an ebon pavement, from the reflection of its overshadowing arags lay a level lake, whose exquisite transparency wanted but the smile of the sun to make it glow like a floor of adamant. On this lake I lay in a little boat, divinely carved from pearl after the similitude of Triton's shelly shallop. Its rudder and its oarage were my own unconscious will, and without the labors of a special volition, 
I floated as I list with a furrowless keel swiftly toward the central giant arch. With every moment that brought me nearer to my exit, the harmony that poured through it developed into a grander volume and an intenser beauty. And now I passed out. Claude Lorraine, freed from the limitations of sense and gifted with an infinite canvas, may, for aught I know, be upon some halcyon island of the universe painting such a view as now sailed into my vision. Fitting employment would it be for his immortality were his pencil dipped into the very fountains of the light. Many a time in the course of my life have I yearned for the possession of some grand old master's soul and culture in the presence of revelations of nature's loveliness which I dared not trust to memory. Before this vision, as now in the remembrance of it, that longing became a heartfelt pain. Yet, after all, it was well. The mortal Lunner would have fainted in his task. Alas, how does the material in which we must embody the spiritual cramp and resist its execution? Standing before windows where the invisible spirit of the frost had traced his exquisite algae, his palms and his ferns, have I said to myself with a sigh, Ah, nature alone of all artists is gifted to work out her ideals. Shall I be so presumptuous as to attempt in words that which would beggar the palette and the pencil of old-time disciples of the beautiful? I will, if it be only to satisfy a deep longing. From the arches of my cavern I had emerged upon a horizonless sea, through all the infinitudes around me, I looked out and met no boundaries of space. Often in after times have I beheld the heavens and the earth stretching out in parallel lines forever, but this was the first time I had ever stood unringed by the azure world, and I exalted in all the sublimity of the new conception. The whole atmosphere was one measureless suffusion of golden motes which throbbed continually in cadence and showered radiance and harmony at the same time. With ecstasy, vision spread her wings for a flight against which material laws locked no barrier, and every moment grew more and more entranced at further and fuller glimpses of a beauty which floated like incense from the pavement of that eternal sea. With ecstasy, the spiritual ear gathered in continually some more distant and unimaginable tone and grouped the growing harmonies into one sublime chant of benediction. With ecstasy, the whole soul sank in revelations from every province and cried out, Oh, awful loveliness! And now, out of my shallop, I was borne away into the full light of the mid-firmament, now seated on some toppling peak of a cloud mountain whose yawning rifts disclosed far down the mines of reserved lightning, now bathed in my ethereal travel by the rivers of the rainbow, which side by side coursed through the valleys of heaven, now dwelling for a season in the environment of unbroken sunlight, yet bearing it like the eagle with undazzled eye, now crowned with a coronal of prismatic beads of dew. Through whatever region or circumstances I passed, one characteristic of the vision remained unchanged. Peace, everywhere, godlike peace, the sum of all conceivable desires satisfied. Slowly I floated down to earth again. There oriental gardens waited to receive me. From fountain to fountain I danced in graceful mazes with inimitable houris whose foreheads were bound with fillets of jasmine. I pelted with figs the rare exotic birds whose golden crimson wings went flashing from branch to branch or wheeled them to me with Arabic phrases of endearment. Through avenues of palm, I walked arm in arm with Hafez and heard the hours flow singing through the channels of his matchless poetry. In gay kiosks, I quaffed my sherbet 
and in the luxury of lawlessness kissed away by drops that other juice which is contraband unto the faithful. And now beneath citron shadows I laid me down to sleep. When I awoke, it was morning, actually morning, and not a hashish hallucination. The first emotion that I felt upon opening my eyes was happiness to find things again wearing a natural air. Yes, although the last experience of which I had been conscious had seemed to satisfy every human want, physical or spiritual, I smiled on the four plain white walls of my bedchamber and hailed their familiar unostentatiousness with a pleasure which had no wish to transfer itself to arabesque or rainbows. It was like returning home from an eternity spent in loneliness among the palaces of strangers. Well may I say an eternity, for during the whole day I could not rid myself of the feeling that I was separated from the preceding one by an immeasurable lapse of time. In fact, I never wholly got rid of it. I rose that I might test my reinstated powers and see if the restoration was complete. Yes, I felt not one trace of bodily weariness nor mental depression. Every function had returned to its normal state with the one exception mentioned. Memory could not efface the traces of my having passed through a great mystery. I recalled the events of the past night and was pleased to think that I had betrayed myself to no one but Dr. H. I was satisfied with my experiment. Ah, would that I had been satisfied. Yet history must go on. Terence McKenna has read stories by Bayard Taylor and Fitzhugh Ludlow, and Kathleen Harrison McKenna has read from Louisa May Alcott and the translations of Sir Richard Burton. Victorian Tales of Cannabis was produced by Sound Photosynthesis, which is Faustin Bray and Brian Wallace at the Sound Photosynthesis Studios. Brian played cello, sarode, guitars, ocarina, percussion, Tibetan bells, sound effects, and various voices. Faustin played flute, percussion, Tibetan bells, marimba, zub tube, and various voices. Lynn Tausig played Chandra Sarang. Harry Ely played hammer dulcimer. Other voices and musicians were Peyton Bray, Morgan Russell, and Bertram Davies with contributions by Roy Tuckman, John Zeitz, and Paul and Steve Gaskin. The preceding program is copyright Sound Photosynthesis. Please browse our website at sound.photosynthesis.com. To obtain information about this recording or to request a catalog containing thousands of other audio and video recordings and books from the cutting edge of cultural evolution, please write Sound Photosynthesis, P.O. Box 2111, Mill Valley, California, 94942 USA. And please browse our website at sound.photosynthesis.com.